And now I'd like to ask Peter Siarto, Minister of Foreign Trade and Affairs, to deliver his speech. Uh, during the morning, the minister will have another formal program. So after his address, unfortunately, he will need to leave, and we will let him go. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours, minister. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to cordially greet you all. Kinga, the situation is even more dramatic than that. It's not only that I have an official program. I have two parliamentary commissions that wish to hear me. Knowing what I'm having to face, I would much more prefer to stay here with you, but then, then you have that annual responsibility of going and reporting to the Parliament. Commissions, uh, dear Judith, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and I'd like to congratulate the Minister of Justice and the Ferenc Madel Institute of Comparative Law for organizing this extremely su successful uh, conference series. Yadranka, I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you very much. I'm ever so grateful. I'm very hopeful that in the next coming period, we are going to have the opportunity to welcome you more and more as uh, hopefully the discussions of Serbia with the EU will enter into a new phase. Hopefully next week, perhaps Tuesday, perhaps there is going to be an IGC opening. Uh, perhaps opening a new chapter, perhaps from next week onwards, I don't have to use the word perhaps anymore, and Oliver's efforts are going to be successful in making sure that if we can discuss in clusters, let us make good use of this opportunity. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, of course, normally a speech should, uh, of course, start by presenting the topic uh, or the problem, and then by investigating it, and then we should have some arguments, and then at the end of the speech, you would get to the solution or you get to the conclusion. Well, if you will permit me, I'm going to turn that around. That allows me to also shorten my speech, but also the important stuff will be said in the beginning, and then we can start coffee much earlier. So if I'm just going to say what we are going to, uh, what's the question we are looking to answer, what is the future of the European Union, or where is the fu uh, future of the European Union, the response is, is in the member states. It's much more in the member states than it is anywhere in Brussels. We believe that the European Union can only be strong if uh, the constituent member states themselves are strong. And there, again, uh, two words uh, that you need to add again. The EU can be strong again if the constituent member states will be strong again. And of course, for the constituent member states to become strong again or stronger again, what we need is for certain competences uh, to be to be given back uh, to member states or to be given to member states. Which are the areas where we need to return these competences? Uh, there are three areas that I would designate where in the past 15 to 20 years we have seen very significant crisis situations shake Europe and the whole world. And in these three areas where you had the crisis, the crisis response or the lack of the crisis response or the unsuitability of the crisis response proved that it would have been much better if uh, member states were given much larger leeway. Financial crisis, economic crisis sometime in 2008, 2009. We had the migration crisis in 2015, which hit uh, then and then has been giving us work. And since then, of course, since last year, the global pandemic. All in all, I believe that uh, the responses given by Europe to these three crises were unfortunately too much ideologically based. Uh, the opportunity of a democratic, democratic debate was very much limited on these issues. If you did not represent the mainstream position, you were immediately branded, stigmatized, and these responses uh, immediately went against the interests of the European people. Therefore, I believe that these responses uh, fundamentally have led to a weakening of the European Union, while if they would have been left uh, in the national competences, uh, the European Union could have come out stronger at the end of these crisis situations than it did. Uh, I would also like to add some arguments. Uh, 
to my statements on the insufficiency of uh, the crisis response for the economic crisis. For 20 years ago, it was 20 percent. Now it's 18 percent of the GDP share of the EU, while our competitors managed to either uh, keep or to increase. China's, China's GDP share is 18 percent. 20 years ago, they were at 4 percent. We were at 21 percent. So they are going up. We're going down. While the 18 percent of the global GDP is what Europe stands for, in Europe, we pay 27 percent of the social expenditure in the world. Of course, these two can uh, look to be in dissonance to each other. And of course, for the future, it is not the most positive picture that it depicts for competitiveness. And it is this ever worsening uh, economic perspective that is basically aggravated by further communistic-like uh, uh, proposals that uh, has to do with uh, certain market-based, uh, market-secured competitive advantage that would be curtailed by political decisions. This is, for example, the negative discrimination of nuclear power. This is, for example, the mobility package that is putting uh, Central European countries uh, at a disadvantage, but also um, several other endeavors. And these do not say anything but the fact that there are some countries that dare to make courageous decisions. There were some countries that dared to make the decisions that had to do with uh, financial austerity and financial discipline. Other countries were simply in, un, incapable. They were not courageous enough. They did not want to take the political risk. They they didn't have a stable enough political system. And now they want to actually com change this political advantage, uh, competitive advantage, with political means. And of course, if this is the approach that is going to dominate the economic policy of the European Union, if they will not allow actual economic competition among member states, then the European Union's external competitiveness will deteriorate further. We believe that in the competition of tax systems, the competition of uh, investment incentives are indeed in favor uh, of the European Union, serve the interests of the European Union. So this competition should be allowed uh, among member states. Instead, what we are seeing is that they want to harmonize the tax systems, this in certain countries should lead to tax increases. And in many cases, the European Commission is sitting on, uh, for months or years even, on uh, requests from member states uh, uh, when the member state wishes to add, give support for job creation. Despite all these endeavors, we will continue to reduce taxes quite naturally from January 1, for example. Uh, and we also wish to extend widespread uh, investment incentives to create new jobs or to bring in new technologies uh, to Hungary. The second such crisis situation is the migration situation itself, where, again, I believe um, there is a total, total failure of uh, Brussels migration policy. And this is testamented, I guess, best testamented by the fact that the European Union today is actually under an, uh, migration pressure from three geographical directions, which has never happened before. Of course, it's a separate cup of tea. That uh, was it not the objective of Brussels migration policy to be under as much a pressure as possible, to have as many migrants arrive as possible is it not the international liberal mainstream's objective? Because migration is the best, most efficient uh, tool to actually alter, to change uh, the national framework, the Christian traditions. And it's a dead giveaway to see what Brussels is actually supporting and what it's not supporting when it comes to migration. Brussels supports everything that increases migration and doesn't support anything that stops migration. It seems technical, it seems boring, but it's telling that in the migration debate, 
basically text uh, is basically the most important thing is what is the most important word that we should use in the text should we manage migration and should we not use the word stop and Brussels supports everything that is about management they support NGOs that have the closest of cooperation with uh, human smugglers that operate ships uh, to bring uh, scores of migrants to Europe support the so-called social integration projects that have completely failed in Western Europe, but do not support do not support border defense and do not support any measures made in the interest of border defense. So much so that since the 2015 period, um, EU is preparing for the largest of migration um, procedure, post-Cotonou. Uh, is a migration agreement that Brussels wants to s sign with uh, 79 countries. And we are having to actually struggle to actually, to actually ensure that this can only be uh, a mixed, uh, mixed agreement, that is a resolution of the European Council, which means that there needs to be a member state ratification for it. Ladies and gentlemen, if the objective is to stop migration, and that is what we want to do here in Central Europe, then we have to accept, uh, based on the past six years, that only member states are able to do that. Only member states can stop migration. Therefore, all the competences with migration policy should be returned to the member states. Border defense should be supported, or at least should be recognized as a right, as an obligation. Furthermore, migration actually carries much more risk than it did in the past six years ever. Because we have to see that while earlier migration, I should say, uh, started to pose a security, then civilizational risk, because for terrorists it was an opportunity to actually uh, get through borders uh, and to spread their uh, ideologies without limitation. And it is a civilizational risk, because loud minorities quite visibly uh, are have started to oppress uh, the large majority. Let's remember uh, the uh, choice between Christmas tree and uh, carton cardboard boxes. Uh, of course, pandemic is spreading much faster uh, with the more people on the road. And while we are all being subjected to all kinds of PCR tests to be controlled, I do not believe that anybody arriving in migration flows would have uh, two PCR tests from the past 72 hours. So, and this leads to the third issue, and that's the global pandemic. I believe that the global pandemic has provided ample proof that it is possible that institutions in Brussels can manage the situation well in peacetime. But when crisis is there, you need fast action. And when you need fast action, these institutions have fail. We were repatriating, of course, it was a mathematical uh, uh, wonder. The more people we brought home, the more people there were. We brought home more than 10,000 Hungarians. Then when everybody was home, we actually uh, got a letter when everybody was home. Uh, we got a letter from the European Commission. They said we would like to pay for the repatriation now. Too late too little, too late. We were able to make good decisions, but this was true also for the procurement of uh, medical equipment. There was absolutely no coordination. We were basically, it was a push and shove with European countries in China getting access to equipment uh, for health. And of course, the Hungarian response to the global pandemic was successful because it was especially, specifically national based. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, all in all, I believe that if we look at economic migration or health crisis management issues, if the majority of the competences would be uh, left to the nation states, then we will have a good chance of making the European Union strong again. And if these economic migration and health uh, pandemic management competences will remain, uh, then Brussels will have time to deal with what they what was their task from the beginning, enlargement of Europe, for example, because that is a union competence. And it would be good that once we have lost the British, 
Uh, now that we have lost one seventh uh, of the GDP and eight percent of the population of the EU, it would be good if we could turn this process around. In the Western Balkans, NATO is leading 3 0 to the European Union. And if we look, if NATO, if, if countries could comply with the security requirements of NATO, I don't quite understand what kind, what kind uh, of uh, excuses we can have. And of course, in the Foreign Affairs Council, we continue here, you know, the Russians, the Turks, Qatar and Saudi and the kind of influence they're gaining on the Balkans. If a team doesn't go on the field, they will never win the match. Uh, and of course, because in geopolitics, in global politics, there is no such thing as a vacuum. If we don't integrate this uh, region, somebody else will. And then all we have to do is uh, be in despair about it. But of course, we have, will have no grounds to be in despair about it. So I do not think that it's an oversimplification of the story if we say that when it comes to the Western Balkans, uh, fundamentally whatever we do there in the western balkans is going to fundamentally def define if the european union is going to be strong we in hungarians are going to push for this in budapest and brussels and with belgrade we will do everything to push this process in the right direction thank you very much for your attention and the invitation thank you